I'm pleased to say I'm joined by from his Twitter profile the professional darts MC, referee, spotter and statistician, also the Chief Development Officer of the WDF, Richard Ashdown. Thanks for the time, Richard. How are you doing? I'm good, Alex. How are you? Doing well, thanks. And we're talking a little over a fortnight since the first WDF World Championship came to an end at Lakeside. You've had a bit of time to reflect. How do you look back on those nine days being back at the home of World Darts? Yeah, I think overall a great success. Um, it, it was certainly worth the wait, wasn't it? Um, such a long time to get back there. And I, and I think uh, the, the tournament ran brilliantly and looked good. And the players and everyone watching were really pleased with it. We last had you on the show in October of last year. All roads were leading to Lakeside, the cut-off for spots. The draw was made, but around two weeks before the event is postponed. How tough was that decision to make so close to the event? Oh, yeah, it was so difficult. I mean, the, the work that had got into it for the players around the world was such a key part of the decision because we had three or four nations, you know, long haul that just couldn't get out of their own country. It wasn't just the COVID-19 situation in the UK. It was the global position and uh, we think on balance we made the right decision because every player that was struggling to get there for January did make it for April. Yeah, We then see the Lakeside rescheduled for early April as you mentioned but before then seven players in the men's field they win their tour cards at Q School but we see the agreement between the WDF and the PDC gives the opportunity for those seven to still play at Lakeside if they wanted to. How pleased were you to get that agreement in place as a sign that there is a, a much better working relationship between the pro and the, the semi-pro amateur bodies now? Yeah, we were delighted with it and I'm delighted for the players that were able to take the opportunity as well because they had earned the right to be there. Uh, they did deserve it and um, the, the PDC put it as a, a one-off exemption and we're very grateful to them that that, that happened. And yeah, the working relationship has always been fine actually since I've been involved with the WDF. If anybody has any sort of political agenda, there certainly isn't one between the PDC and the WDF. I've not found any problems since I've been involved. So, yeah, it was very good that we could cooperate in that instance. Good to hear. Well, there was still some more changes to the lineup. We saw Fallon Sherrick come back in, but then withdraw a, a few days later. Were you surprised to see Fallon pull out for a second time? Yeah, it was a shock to us. You know, it came, like you said, just a matter of days after accepting the re invitation. So, yeah, very disappointing, but. Um, Fallon has her own reasons we don't know what they are and we respect them if she says she can't play she can't play well let's get on to Lakeside and I was fortunate to be there for the opening weekend a lot of games a lot of darts but it was great to see the event finally happen for you also being the MC what was it like getting up on stage for that first walk on and announcing we are back at Lakeside it did feel good the thing is it, 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 for me personally it felt good because it was sort of the part of the job that I'd given the least consideration to there were there'd been so much involvement in the planning and the running of the event from my side, the emceeing the event almost became an afterthought. And I don't mean that in a, in a way that I didn't care about it because everything I do, I make sure I do properly. But yeah, it wasn't on my mind that morning. What was on my mind that morning was making sure everything was right in a production sense, in the venue and for the players. So yeah, it really felt good, especially you know introducing Martin Adams to the stage in the first match. Uh, that was a really nice starter against Jared Cole and yeah, he sort of set the tone for the whole week. Something else I wanted to clear up as well was on that first Sunday social media, a lot of reports about Makuru Suzuki's World Championship trophy being taken away by Des Jacklin, a lot of rumours doing the rounds, police being called to Lakeside. We wanted to get the truth to our listeners on, on what actually happened that day. Yeah, I was made aware of the, 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 the police may have been called by Des Jacklin, but no police actually came to the venue. Um, I believe that the situation was sorted out amic amicably, I can't even say it, <laughs> between um, Makuru's management and uh, Des, with the WDF involved, but I wasn't personally. And then to see the reports go online a few hours later of the police had been at the venue, which just wasn't the case. So, yeah, it, it all seemed to have been news after the fact. The trophy had already been handed over yeah, it, it was a bit of a storm in a teacup, to be honest. Well, as far as the darts, there was plenty of stories to come out of the week. We had Richard Veenstra breaking the Lakeside record average, the ladies' highest checkout going, Bo Greaves, the youngest winner, Thibaut Tricol, the first French finalist, Neil Duff, the first world champion from Northern Ireland. What moments have stuck with you from the week? Well, you've just listed them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I think um, a key thing that had been a concern was the amount of people in the audience. <clears throat> so 
we were concerned about it. Uh, were keen to put over the atmosphere. So something that became clear very early on that despite the venue not being at capacity, the atmosphere both in the venue and on the television came over really well. And the key people involved in that, of course, that you wanted to benefit are the players. So it was all about the player experience for us. There were a lot of debutants around half the field were playing there for the first time. So that's the first thing that sticks in my mind about giving these players the opportunity to play at Lakeside, the proverbial home of world darts, have that feeling and I think that was fulfilled. So from that, if the players are feeling good, in the right place, the organisation was superb, the good darts will follow. And there were so many great games throughout the, the week that um, people enjoyed, or some of them, them you've mentioned. Um, the, the Richard Fellowship performance was obviously very, very good to watch. Uh, the return of Wayne Warren as a champion onto the Lakeside stage was, was a really nice moment, albeit 24 hours later than it should have been due to the generator failure. But yeah, moments like that stick in my mind. I particularly did enjoy that Wayne Warren entrance and, and the match that followed against Lee Shewan, who also played brilliantly. Yeah, lots of good matches. I think the darts was the talking point, which is what you want, of course, at any event. It was about the darts. Definitely. And you, you touched on there the, the ticket sales, um, the empty seats for a, a lot of the week. I know you said on social media about the prices is something you weren't particularly happy with. How does the WDF go about addressing that for the next World Championship? Well, if it's to be at Lakeside, it, it won't continue the way that it has because it can't. But this is quite early in that discussion, to be honest, because, yeah, we still need to... If we're gonna, I, I, I don't think it's a secret from my point of view that I would like this event to be at Lakeside. So for it to be at Lakeside, we have to make sure that everything is right for it to be there. And ticket prices are one of the things that we have to make sure are right going forward. The event as well it had wall-to-wall coverage on Eurosport, a lot of sessions on free-to-air on Quest as well, and there was a, a lot of good feedback I was seeing about the coverage. What's the p- feedback that you've had from Eurosport, viewing figures, how it went overall? Yeah, they're absolutely delighted. We've had nothing but good feedback on that on that front. Yeah, with both, as you say, how it looked and also how well it was viewed. I think um, that was a, a success in every department. We, we were delighted with the production. And, and delighted with the viewing figures. I'm sure a lot of people that were watching will want to know we've got the return of the World Masters lined up for December. Is there any plans to have more WDF events televised on Eurosport this year? Yeah, that's being discussed at the moment. Nothing finalised. And uh, as soon as it is, we'll, we'll get out there because we're, we're going to be the ones that want to shout about it. So, yeah, you see the discussion for sure. And, you know, we, we, were, we were very close to announcing that last year for the World Masters. But again, because of the COVID situation, the, the Netherlands were unable to host the event so um, but that's the thing with television. Those conversations have to restart. You don't just, it's not like a postponing on the calendar and giving it another day. You have to kind of start from the beginning again. So, um, yeah, well, of course. And there's, you know, we've got the new event in Australia that's lined up. You know, that's going to have decent coverage. And again, we're just waiting to see exactly what platforms that's going to be on as well. Fingers crossed for that. You mentioned big events in the Netherlands. There's none bigger really than the Dutch Open, which is coming back this mm. June after a few years away. How much are you looking forward to that one? I love the event. And, and it's such a, it's amazing how much bigger it is than any other event. I don't think there's an event even half the scale of the Dutch Open. Um, it has had to have a postponement this year. Again, we don't need to say why, but you know, it's, <laughs> that's another event that's in an unusual place on the calendar. So that will be, this will be a bit of a transitional year for them, I think, because their traditional slot is February, this time it's in June, but I think their entry levels are already over two thousand. So you know, and that's to them, that's still quite low. It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be a roaring success. I'm sure it will be. We also mentioned that Australian Darts Open. That's an event that got announced fairly recently. We're going to see the world champions Neil Duff, Bo Greaves there in the field. It's got platinum ranking status. How important is it to get these events on around the world again to grow the game? Yeah. I, a full calendar is what we set out to achieve. It's taken a long time to get it back. We're still not there yet. There are still many nations that traditionally have their ranking opens, uh, France or Luxembourg, for example, that don't have events on the calendar yet this year. So uh, I think 2023 will be the real telling point when you look at a full calendar without restriction. But yes, making sure there are events globally is certainly our um, objective. Asia, for example, are really still struggling with lockdowns and quarantines and things like that, you know, due to the pandemic. So it's taking a while to get things reset and things 
back to where they should be. Well, you kind of answered my next question there. I was going to mention mm. Thibaut Tricot. He made that final and mm. asked about the dart scene in France. We've not had that French Open since 2019. It's probably a bit late now for 2022, but is there any developments on that coming back next year? We're in, dis- in, you know, in discussion with all of the members and, and the reasons they're not doing You know, a lot of... Uh, Luxembourg's a better example, actually, in terms of the venue that they actually use for the Luxembourg Open is now a vaccination centre. So it's things like that that have just hindered the preparation of these open events. So France in a similar position. So, yeah, I mean, the interest from France, by the way, media-wise and, and, and from Eurosport themselves, are absolutely delighted with the progress that Thibaut made. It was excellent for the tournament. And like you said, a Northern Irish champion. So that kind of thing is exactly, you know, you can't script it, but that's exactly what you kind of hope for with, with the first WDF World Championship, that there was some global reaches and different nations are benefiting. Definitely. Well, you've got the, the first World Championship. That's in the books. Uh, I know it's still very early days, only been a few weeks, but any sort of idea yet on when next year's one's going to be? Are you going to go back to that normal January slot? Are you looking at Lakeside again? I'm quite open-minded about it. The, uh, the January slot it was dictated primarily by both broadcaster and venue. So if you have those two parties happy with that, then of course the WF are going to go with whatever they would like. What I think the April postponement proved is that it can work at any time of year. So I'm very open to alternatives. But ultimately, that decision will lie with the broadcaster and in turn the host. And we will just make it work whenever they wish to have it. Well, the WDF tour continues last weekend. We had events in Scotland, Iceland. Good to see both of those covered with dark connect and i know it's not easy to get all these events covered on there but is that something that wdf actively looking at or at least working on how they can cover these events so fans can follow along yeah absolutely conversations just in the last few days about that we, we want to make the incentives better for the nations to use dark connect it's not obligatory but it certainly would be recommended and it actually makes the administration of the event so much easier all round. so that's the way it's headed for sure dark connect has been a great support i think it's a great initiative and Hopefully more and more of the events, certainly the bigger events, um, you know, use it. Let's hope so. And lastly, away from the darts, I'd say I was one of the lucky ones to see you and Andy Dundas sing Summer Nights on Karaoke in the Lakeside Hotel. I won't ask for a rendition now, but as I wasn't there for the rest of the week, who else impressed you on the karaoke and who didn't quite hit the high notes? The first name that comes into my mind, can I just explain the situation there, by the way? (laughs) Um, it was actually it was actually Anka Zellstrup that brought a small karaoke system over to the hotel where all of the or majority of the players or all of the crew and the officials were staying purely just to give us a bit of ambience of an evening once we go back to the hotel um, it was something that wasn't so much pre-planned but it was a success but unfortunately one of our media team who we both know well Harry Deacon kind of took it upon himself to rule the karaoke whether that was popular or unpopular I always think when you, it's a bit like a dance exhibition when you go to a dance exhibition you enjoy watching someone play well don't you but it's really good fun when someone plays bad you know you can have a joke about it so let's just say that that was one of the highlights of the karaoke when Harry got on there and we'll leave it there <laughs> well Richard it's a pleasure to, to catch up appreciate the time and congratulations on getting that first world championship on and we wish you all the best for the rest of the year Yeah, my thanks to you, Alex, and my apologies again to Henry. Thank you.